Right, good day learners and welcome to our next module, module 1.2 of your grade 11 CAT curriculum where we are talking about input and output devices. Now, um, this is a fairly long module so I'm going to be breaking this up into this first video where I deal just with input and then the next video will deal with output um, because I see in our content as well we are going to look at input, we're going to look at output, we're going to look at interactive whiteboards, input and output for physically challenged users. So let's see how far I get with this one. I might do all of this and then, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we're going to split it up. Right, so input. Remember, when we talk about input, we are talking about giving instructions to the particular device. So it provides running software with instructions on what to do next. Input can be data that must be processed. Data, that is input, may need to be used immediately or it may need to be stored for processing later. So let's look at some of these input devices. First of all, in input we have image capture. What does this mean? This means you are, you are taking a picture of something, right? You are capturing an image. So picture data has become increasingly important in the way we use computers. And what do we use? Um, digital cameras, mostly in the form of smartphone cameras we have digital compact cameras and then the larger ones these ones these big ones our dslr and when we talk about a dslr camera we're talking about one where you can detach the lens and attach another one okay so don't forget that if we talk about a point and shoot digital camera we're talking about these ones okay so let's let, let's not forget that Right, let's look at our digital camera. We know there are advantages. It allows you to take many photos. You can see the image immediately and you can easily transfer that to your computer. No hassle there, right? But there are certain specs that determine the quality. So what I'm saying to you here is when you go out to either buy a DSLR camera, point and shoot digital camera, or you're even looking at the camera on your smartphone, you need to ask these questions okay what sort of lens does it have the sensor size the optical zoom the digital zoom the resolution the iso rating and don't worry we're going to be going through each one of these so you understand what is actually being said here but these are the things you need to be um, asking when it comes to purchasing a particular digital camera obviously it's going to depend on what you're going to be doing with it then we have scanners now we know what our scanner does this is an input device that scans images to a computer, um, especially with our flatbed scanner here. It converts a hard copy of, let's say, a document, an image, whatever it is, into digital format. Um, we've got barcodes, photos, documents, 3D objects. We've got our uh, barcode scanner here as well. But what is important, I mean, we know what a scanner is and, and what a scanner does, but do you see that we're talking about quality here? We're talking about image quality. When we looked at our digital camera, the specs that determine the quality. Please, this is important. Now with our scanner, the quality is determined by two things. Our resolution. Now, the software allows you to specify the resolution. The higher this number is, the higher the number, the, the DPI is, the dots per inch, the better the image quality is going to be. However, please remember, like with your phone, the higher the quality of the image that you are you know, taking uh, a picture with, the larger the resulting image file is going to be. So it's nice to take a um, very high quality pic, but just understand that it's going to result in a large size or file size as well. Then we've got the color depth. So we've got our resolution, then the color depth, the number of different colors that can be represented by a particular pixel. So when you see them talking about 24-bit color, they're saying it's about 16.7 million different colors, and that is high enough for practical purposes. The higher, again, do you see what's happening here? The higher the color depth, the larger the resulting image file. Same as this. Okay? So it's beautiful to have high numbers in terms of your color depth and your resolution. Um, you know, that your, your pixel can give you so many different colors. Beautiful, but just understand it's going to result in fairly large images. Okay, so 
when we when it comes to and I'm just going to give you this tip when it comes to advantages and disadvantages please you don't have to know everything but at know at least two of each and this applies to anything so just two and you should be fine All right so advantages we can take large documents scan them into a single digital file this allows us to have electronic copies stored digitally we can scan copies that can be emailed directly and this is probably the most important bit and something that gets asked in every exam where they talk about scanners, the OCR software. This is optical character recognition software. Um, what is it used for? It's used on documents containing text, scanned as images, to convert these images into editable documents. So this piece of software allows you to scan in a document and edit it. Old documents can be scanned in. Uh, barcode scanners are good for libraries and point of sale. QR codes connect to websites quickly. So you can use any of these. I mean, even when you get stopped by the um, traffic cops on the road, they can scan your number plate, scan your, your ID, your driver's license, any of these things. So there are a lot of them being used around. Unfortunately, um, especially if you are scanning a lot of pages or like a book, um, it can take a lot of time, and this is the big one. The quality of the digital image depends largely on the original hard copy. So if the hard copy is all crumpled up and torn and things like that, well, then that's what you're going to get as an image as well. Okay, then we have biometric input. So this is where we are now using a biological feature that we have, our fingerprints, our voice. Um our eyes, you know, any anything like that. And there they mentioned capturing unique biological features of a person. So what do these scanners do? They read and recognize any part of you that's biologically unique. Fingerprint, iris. I mean, guys, most of you have this on your smartphones where you're using your fingerprint instead of a code. Now, here we can see a few examples. Here's your fingerprint scanner, and that's with your phone or with... A device like that some people use it or some companies end up using these things um, for timekeeping purposes at work this is one where it is scanning your iris this is another one where it's scanning your entire face a lot of us are familiar also with voice recognition especially with um, technology within the home where you can say you know alexa switch the lights on you know google i'm looking for this things like that so that's all um, under your biometric input. Now, again, we're going to go through some advantages and disadvantages. Again, you only need to know like two of these. So the main advantage is security. Um, defeating it is very difficult and only the authorized person will get in. But something like this is going to be expensive to implement, maintain and use. And it will probably need additional hardware and software that's sometimes not included. We also have input at ATMs which gets its input from you, the user, through a PIN code, through menu choices. Um, other input can come through the card reader, the, the network connection, the touch screen, the money count, all of these things. Again, there are certain advantages. You can bank any time of day or night. You're not limited to your own bank. But they don't tell you how you are charged for that, so be careful. Um, your disadvantages are, yeah, um, you know, one of the things that really gets me with an ATM is an ATM at night seems to be on its own little island in the middle of nowhere. And there's just like one light that lights up the ATM. I mean, it's, a, it's a dangerous story, <laughs> especially late at night. Uh, you have card skimmers that get installed. You've got, you know, these criminals that are there to try and steal your money um, at the ATMs as well. So just be careful with that. Then we have input into our, what's that POS? It's our point of sale system. So now we're talking about the shops, all right? They use barcodes and RFID or radio frequency identification tags. These are used to recognize a product or item. The barcode scanner will scan the barcode. The RFID tags store data on the tag or card and it's detected wirelessly. And here's an example of the two right um we see today also the the qr codes um being used 
as well. Right, so they are there to achieve two main goals. Faster processing at pay points. Imagine if everything had to be written down at a toll when you get there. And they have to look up the records in a book to see the price of various things. Can you imagine how long that would take? And it's there for better stock control. So that's the main purpose behind all of this. So we can have a look at how all of this works and we can see our little, I don't know why the IT guy has to look like that, but anyway, um, our stock control, we see that this individual ensures the item description, quantity for the barcode, RFID code, he allocates the price, monitors the stock quantity. The, the whole idea of a system like this is that from our servers, and, and this is why today, no matter which branch of a particular store you go to, they can access your information. So if you go to Woolworths um, in PE and you buy something, you can actually go and exchange it if you are at a Woolworths store in Johannesburg because they are all linked um, and your details are shared throughout the various stores because of systems like this that they have in place. Now, there are advantages faster typing in with the prices, prices are updated more accurately, stock control is done much, much, much better. But when the system is offline, like when load shedding first hit, it was difficult for a lot of these shops to function. And you can imagine the equipment is expensive as well. Okay, so these are just some of the things we need to know over there. Again, this was with our near field communication and I'm throwing these things in as a reminder, as a reminder. Um, some of the smartphones, and I know some of you are busy with these things, um, have an additional radio technology called NFC, our near field communication, which we spoke about previously. Mainly used for processing and I'm just giving you another picture so you can see this technology. And the reason why I'm including this is because we're now using this near field communication in our point of sale, right? Remember, what are you doing? You are taking your phone, you are scanning it there, you are inputting your details, right? Um, touch screens, we know are also input devices. Please remember a touch screen is both an input and output device, okay? Input and output. Uh, we know our advantages of our touch screens, it allows more screen space, um, we can immediately touch and, you know, control certain things. Very intuitive. I mean, we see two or three year olds using these things. It allows for natural input, um, especially where drawing and gestures are concerned. Now, it's not as fast or easy as using a physical keyboard. Oh, it can become dirty, oily, smudged, broken, scratched, damaged. Have a look at your smartphone. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Okay. Um, then we also have data collection devices, so meter readers to capture water readings. Um, data collection devices that monitor the patient's temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, all input. Weather boys in, in the oceans collect data on weather conditions. Um, they can be used to monitor temperature, pressure, humidity in controlled environments, all of these different things. These are data collection devices. The, the point of this device is to just collect the specific data that they need. Now, um, it's captured automatically using certain sensors. It's obviously more accurate than human beings, and it can be captured a lot faster. But again, these sensors can fail. And only sensor detectable data can be collected. So if it's if the sensor is there to monitor your um, heart rate or your blood pressure, right? It can't detect your sugar level, right? It's only meant to do one thing. And these devices can be difficult and expensive to update. Just look at some of the hospitals that we have that don't even have this equipment because, yeah, not going there, but it's it's very expensive to have these things. We can also have input into smartphones and consumer tablets, right? How is that done? Through the touch screen, through hardware buttons, through camera, video, acce ooh, accelerometer, please people. Please, the accelerometer, um, this is a feature where I can turn my smartphone, let's say, over on into like a landscape view and the image will then rotate that way as well. 
Um, there have been talk of alternative keyboards, things like our virtual keyboards, um, a keyboard that's supposed to be able to be projected onto a surface um, using LED lights, and then I can actually type on that surface in order to have that input go um, into the particular device. Yeah, it hasn't been something that's that's really been utilized, but that's what they wanted to do with alternative keyboards. We also have alternative input devices like game controllers and game pads. Um, they are handheld input devices designed to connect a user to a computer or gaming system. I don't even have to say anything further <laughs> over there. We've also got our VR controllers that allow users to explore the virtual world environment and pick up or manipulate virtual objects. So this is also input, right? These are alternative input devices.